How's it going everybody? My name's Dave Whipple and you're watching Bush Radical. In today's video I'd like to take you guys all the way back to the turn of the century, the winter of 1999-2000. Brooke and I spent that winter in the Aleutian Islands caretaking a very remote homestead. That winter was quite the adventure and this is the story of that winter. I hope you enjoy it. It all started in uh, Stargavin Campground in Sitka. Uh, we bought this camper trailer in Sitka in the summer of 1999, and we got jobs as caretakers in Stargavin Campground, uh, which was great because it was right across the street from the ocean, from Sitka Sound. Gorgeous scenery. Sitka is just a fantastic place. Towards the end of the summer, we started making plans for what we wanted to do for the winter, and we got a hold of this copy of a magazine called the Caretaker's Gazette. In the Caretaker's Gazette, there was an advertisement for a homestead, very, very remote on the tip of the Alaska Peninsula, right at the first Aleutian Island, and it was called Stonewall Place. The owners of this homestead, they traveled to Homer and spent the winter in Homer. They were commercial fishermen. So we contacted the people who owned the place and they were very interested in having us be caretakers. And we packed up the camper at the end of the season, drove through the Yukon Territory, up to Fairbanks, drove down to Anchorage. We flew from Anchorage all the way to here. Now this is the Stonewall Place. It's a remote homestead. It's been there for a long time. It, it was uh, featured in Alaska Magazine at one point. And it belonged to a family, Buck and Shelley Lakitis, and their two kids. And gorgeous, gorgeous views right out on the ocean. To the north was the Bering Sea, and to the south was the, the North Pacific. This homestead was completely off-grid. It had a water wheel that ran off a creek up the mountain that would generate a little bit of electricity. They had chickens that we watched all through the winter for eggs. This little beautiful greenhouse set up. And this is the namesake of Stonewall Place, this giant stone outcropping. This is actually Stonewall. And if you look far beyond it on the very far coast over there is uh, the village of False Pass, although you can't see it. We had no neighbors whatsoever. Our closest neighbor was this place. This is a place called Lonesome Einers. And of course you can see no one had been there for a long, long time. Right before the owner left for the winter, we went out and drug in some big driftwood logs. And that was gonna be our firewood for the winter. You can see by some of the scenery coming up that uh, Faults Pass has no trees, so who knows what these logs were or where they came from. We also went out with the owner before he left and fished for a bit of halibut. Now we'd take these halibut and take them to the city's freezer. The city had a community freezer. And when I say city, I mean that very loosely. There was about 30 people there. It was mostly an abandoned uh, cannery. Now we didn't go out there just by ourselves. We brought our dog, Hooli. And we also brought our cat, Mabel. There was a little bit of a hiccup to the whole situation. And that was this guy. His name was Dingo. He was a blind 12-year-old Australian Shepherd. Not the friendliest dog in the world, but he'd lived his entire life at Stonewall Place. He'd never been anywhere else. And uh, he wasn't the most social animal. Brooke loved to go berry picking, and she would pick a whole bunch of salmon berries. And it was a great opportunity to get those dogs out and walk them. But we found out very soon that you had to walk the dogs separately. All those spots on my hand, those are bite wounds. We found out really quick that uh, Huli and Dingo did not get along. I ended up with a tooth through the top of my left thumb and several other bite holes. Brooke ended up with a puncture wound in her leg. Separating a dog fight is no joke, and I, I wouldn't advise it. It's the last time I'll try. It's hard to pick a guitar with dog bites all over your hands. If you look in this picture, you can see this set of railroad tracks just going down into the water. That was actually key to our transportation. This boat an 18 and a half foot Tolman skiff 
was the only transportation we had to and from the homestead. This boat was plywood and epoxy made by a guy named Ren Tolman out of Homer. It was a fantastic boat, and of all the boats I've had the opportunity to use during my lifetime, I would say that that boat was as fine as they come. You would lower that boat down that set of railroad tracks on the little cart that the boat sat on. This way you could pull it way up out of the water during any kind of storm so it wouldn't be beat against the beach. Once you got the boat and the cart deep enough in the water, it's just like launching a boat off a boat trailer. You'd shove the boat off of the cart and then pull the cart back up the tracks. And we'd take that boat and skiff across about three and a half miles open water to get to the village of False Pass. That post was an interesting feature of this boat. It'd give you something to hang onto while you ran the tiller of the engine. In this picture, I was 23 years old. Man, that was a long time ago. Once we'd get to town, we would park our boat at the city dock. We were the only people anywhere in the area that actually had a working skiff in the water. So if we got in trouble, we were pretty much on our own. One thing about that center post in the boat, you would have to watch which side of the dock you parked that boat on. Because if the tide was running and the boat got underneath the dock on a rising tide, it could get caught on that post and ultimately shove the post through the bottom of that boat. This is the village of Falls Pass. It's basically an abandoned Peter Pan seafood factory cannery setup. All along the waterfront area, the ground was pretty questionable. So all these buildings are built on pilings and you can see there's quite a boardwalk system. Now, when we would go to Falls Pass, one of the things that we went for was to hit this post office and get our mail. It was sometimes two weeks between trips to town because the, the wind and the waves and the weather in that part of the world is so unpredictable and it's so violent. You didn't often have a window where you could get your boat to town and get back safely. So we'd pick and choose the times we'd risk it. We'd also visit George Milak and Carol Mills. George was the caretaker of the year before us and Carol was the town doctor. Although she could probably treat everyone in town in an afternoon because I think altogether there was about 30 people that actually wintered in False Pass. Here's somebody's black lab looking at the garbage truck. Yeah, that's right. This was the town garbage truck. An old utility box pickup with some plywood on the back and garbage spray painted on it. Another thing interesting about False Pass is the town was just ate up with foxes. Everywhere you looked, you'd see foxes. And I think they came in as it got colder in the fall. And then by spring, they were pretty much all killed off by the few local dogs that were there. This is a picture of leaving False Pass. That mountain right behind the village, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I believe that was a 14,000 foot mountain. And of course, that's right from sea level. Uh, quite an impressive mountain. Of course, being in the Aleutian Islands for seven months with nothing to do other than caretake a homestead, we had lots of time to take dogs for walks. Like I mentioned earlier, keeping them separated was a full-time job. We would always walk down the beach to the south, and we would walk past this rock spire. This was called Eagle's Nest, and the reason they called it Eagle's Nest is, well, there, on top of it, there was an eagle's nest. Lots of times you'd walk by there and that eagle would just keep an eye on you, waiting to see what you were up to. Another thing I love to do is take Hooli to this rock pile. It was his favorite thing to do. This rock pile was full of ermine, these little small weasels that change color in the wintertime. Hooli would chase those little weasels all over that rock pile. It was just like whack-a-mole, because they'd pop up here and of course he'd run there and then they'd pop up somewhere else. That dog wasn't about to catch any of them. One day he was uh, fixated on a big hole that went back into the rock pile and he wouldn't leave. I went over to see what was up with him and there was a, there was a river otter in the back of that hole. I had to get him away from there before that thing chewed his head off. He was pretty fearless, but not a ton of common sense. One day, Brooke and Hooli and I walked to the top of that peak in the background. That's called Sentinel Peak. I'm not much of a mountain climber, and even though it was only 2,500 feet or so, by the time we got to the top, I was put out. 
You can see Hooli feels the same way. He's having a seat too. But Brooks partying. Actually, that is not a fifth of gin. It's a uh, it's an empty bottle that happened to be at the homestead, and we used it as a canteen. This is 20 years ago. Nobody carried water bottles around, so we just used what we had handy. This ought to tell you something about the volatility of the weather. This is the same trip, and this picture was probably taken within an hour of the last one. The weather had completely turned for the worse, and we had to gear up with all our rain gear. You can see the dog's ears getting blown up in the wind. About this time in the fall, it really started to get cold. And uh, winter finally showed up in the Aleutians. Within 24 hours, this is what it looked like. One of the beautiful things about wintering here at Falls Pass was this hot tub. This is a snorkel hot tub and it's made out of cedar. It's basically like a water barrel and it has a stove inside the water itself. Brooke and I would spend lots of evenings enjoying the view in that hot tub. That hot tub was truly one of the magical things about spending a winter there at Stonewall Place. One day we decided we were going to go sledding for the afternoon. And we made a contest of who could go the farthest starting from the same point. We sledded for hours and hours. Finally, on the last run of the evening, I ran over a piece of iron pipe that somebody had driven into the side of that hill for no apparent reason and it split the sled right down the center, took a big chunk out of the back of my pants and put a bruise on my butt the size of my fist. I wasn't doing much for the next few days and sledding, as far as I was concerned, was all done. We had a special wood stove that didn't take a ton of wood. It had a water jacket and as the wood stove burned, it heated up the water and circulated it to a 500 gallon tank that was built into its own room. So a couple backpacks of wood like this would heat that place for about four or five days. About this time in the winter, a small herd of caribou showed up. And we got some great pictures of these guys. I figured there would be more caribou that would come through. And Brooke wanted to shoot one of these guys and we could have used the meat. And I talked her out of it because my back at that time was completely out. And I always regretted that because it would have been nice to have caribou all winter and she could have handled butchering that herself. Um, I was such a wreck at that point. I, I talked her out of it and I've always, uh, I always wish I hadn't. Beautiful pictures of these guys. Speaking of pictures, 90% of the pictures out here in the Aleutian Islands were taken by Brooke. I'm really thankful that she had the foresight to uh, keep a camera handy. It sure helps later on when you want to tell the story. Well, about this time, winter really showed up. A record winter, even for Falls Pass area. And the entire straits between us and the town of Falls Pass completely plugged up with icebergs. About this time, cabin fever was getting the best of me. Not only were we isolated in the middle of nowhere, a thousand miles from civilization, but we couldn't even get to town to get a $10 jar of peanut butter and two weeks worth of back mail. We were completely stuck. We had a little family of otters that lived down the way and they didn't mind the ice at all. They had a great time. But the people on the other hand, we were kind of going through it. You could see that blizzard in the background. We had a few blizzards that got so bad we could look out the front window and not see a chair that was four feet in front of the window on that deck that you see to the left. This is what the town of Falls Pass looked like during that time. Once again, you can look around and you just don't see anyone. And there's a reason, because there's really hardly anyone there. And if you were at the stone wall itself, that big stone outcrop, looking across at the homestead. This is the view that you would have then. Massive icebergs just plugged that whole straits. Even Hooli was snowed in. This ended up being one of the coldest, snowiest winters Falls Pass had ever had. 
Or remember earlier when Brooke was picking all the salmon berries? This was her project. She was making a batch of salmon berry wine. And about this time, it was ready to go. I think she ended up with about three or four gallons of this salmon berry wine. If you've ever had it, there's nothing like it. Anything that you put in a pot, Hooli was interested in it. So you can see he wants to check out what's going on here. This ice and isolation, it just hung on and hung on. You could see out there, there was a little bit of open water that we could have used to boat into town and get a $20 jar of peanut butter and five weeks of back mail. But there's no way we could get to it. Half of those straits were completely plugged with ice. If there's one picture of the entire winter time in the Aleutian Islands that encapsulates the way I felt about it at that time, it's this one. I was trying in this picture to cut ice off of the railroad tracks with the hopes of launching our boat to pick our way across the straits in the middle of 10 ton icebergs in the hopes of getting to False Pass to get a little gasoline to run a generator so we could have lights at night, get a $30 jar of peanut butter and five months of back mail. Getting out was a top priority. I spent that day in a set of hip waders clearing those tracks out. Well, the good news is, eventually, the weather changed and the winds changed and the pass was blown free of ice. All that was left was to clean a little bit off the tracks and with a little bit of care and a little patience, we could get over to town. It was just amazing to be able to get in a boat and travel somewhere and get away from the homestead after being locked tight by ice for so long. I mean, the dogs would even get out and try a little bit of fishing. I never did any good out there with a fishing pole. If you look way in the back of this picture, you can see the crab boats are coming through the pass. Now, later on, the Discovery Channel would run a program called The Deadliest Catch and make these guys famous. I'm sure there's a lot of boats that went through that pass that you might know by name now from that show. We took a skiff ride one day down south onto the peninsula of Unamak Island and visited this old village. This village was wiped out by a tsunami in the 40s and a couple buildings were still standing. And in that cold, bleak weather, it is amazing how well preserved these buildings were. Well, the weeks rolled by and spring showed up and pretty soon it was almost time for us to head out. It was now the year 2000, a completely new century. And this is how we started it, as caretakers of Stonewall Place, a very remote homestead on the very tip of the Alaska Peninsula, across the Straits from False Pass on Unamak Island. Hardly a day goes by when I don't think about some part of that eight months spent in the Aleutian Islands. It was quite the landmark in our lives. Thank you guys so much for taking the time out of your day to relive this adventure with Brooke and I. My name's Dave Whipple, and you've been watching Bush Radical. And be radical, eh? See you soon.